Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for University of Washington's Asia Pacific Military Fellows final presentation. In partnership with the Jackson School of International Studies, UW Tacoma has had the privilege of hosting Lieutenant Colonel Jaron Price for his 10 month fellowship at UW, the first fellow in this new program. As part of the internal training offered by the Army, um, officers can apply for a year of study through the U.S. Army War College. An option for this year-long training is to attend a host institution such as University of Washington. While the majority of security-related fellowships typically occur in D.C. or the East Coast, with the exception of Stanford, um, this is the first time that our fellows have found their way west of the Mississippi and the University of Washington has had such a fellowship. Notably, it's focused and appropriately focused on the Asia Pacific region. The idea for the fellowship came about through the university's partnership with Joint Base Lewis McCord and offers the opportunity for our faculty to share their deep expertise with military officers, and I would say that's a reciprocal sharing, and for our students to interact with those officers as well. And we can see from Jaron's background why he was selected for this opportunity and also why a year devoted to the academic study of the Asia Pacific region would be useful. Lieutenant Colonel Price was commissioned as an armor officer upon his graduation from Weber State University. He has served in Bosnia, Germany, Kosovo, Kuwait, Iraq, and Korea. In 2000, he transferred from the armor branch to military intelligence. Before coming to UW, Jaron was the chief of military intelligence enlisted assignments at the U.S. Army Human Resource Command in Fort Knox, Kentucky. This summer, he will report to Pearl Harbor to serve as the strategic intelligence officer in the United States Pacific Command Joint Intelligence Operations Center. All right, doesn't have a cute acronym. Um, there are several unique aspects of this fellowship. First, it is a partnership across two UW campuses. And we think Rashad Kasaba and the Jackson School of International Studies um, for this great partnership. Second, it includes two trips to Washington, D.C. to meet relevant congressional and committee staffers and Pentagon officials. And thirdly, Jaron's senior Army mentor, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Lanza, also present with us today, is close by, so he's been able to communicate with him regularly and face-to-face. -face. We would also like to thank General Lanza for his support and for being such a great partner, along with the JBLM team for their support for this program and for continuing such a great partnership with the UW. I would like now to introduce the director of the University of Washington's Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies, Dr. Rashad Kasaba. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you uh, for being here. About three years ago, I was at a dinner here at the University of Washington, Tacoma, and I happened to be at the same table uh, with General Lanza, who was about to come in as the commanding officer of I Corps at the time. And we had this conversation about, wouldn't it be nice to have an Army fellow housed at the University of Washington? And then uh, we started talking about the Pacific region and the importance of that region for the US. And uh, so, uh, obviously, uh, University of Washington is a tremendous source of knowledge and information um, about the Pacific uh, region and about the world in general. And I am really amazed that in the uh, following um, year or so, we managed to move several bureaucracies uh, across the oceans and the continent. One of them, of course, is the University of Washington bureaucracy. Even though we are parts of the same institution, you would be amazed how difficult it is to bring the budgets in line and to agree what will move where and when. And then the other, of course, is the Army bureaucracy, which we were very pleased and fortunate to have General Lanza to help us with that. And he's been an incredible supporter and advocate. And, uh, and then we were very fortunate, of course, to have Jaron as the first fellow. Uh, he has been, in the short time he's been with us uh, at the University of Washington, 
He has been a tremendous colleague, uh, a tremendous source of information and help for our students, for our faculty, a, a presence that we will sorely miss when he leaves. So it was a very good beginning for this program, and I'm very pleased that it will continue. And I also uh, had uh, great colleagues here, and I cooperated with Lisa Hoffman, of course, and, and Roz came on, and uh, this has been a tremendous cooperation, and, and I'm really looking forward to its continuation. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very pleased that the University of Washington and the Jackson School has been part of this partnership, and I'm really uh, looking forward to the coming years and more fellows. Chancellor Lavitt, Lieutenant General Lanza, Dr. Kasaba, thank you so much for having me here today and allowing me to present my research. This has truly been a fantastic year at the Jackson School and University of Washington Tacoma. Working with all the faculty, the students, and the JBLM community has been an absolutely memorable year. And I hope that the uh, incoming fellow will have you know, a great experience just like I did, and I'm sure that, that he will. As part of the fellowship, um, I'm tasked with doing a, a research project for the, for the Army. And as I came in, it, I had some you know, very broad ideas of things that I wanted to, to take a look at. It seemed like everyone was focused on the, on the South China Sea, which is a, a very important issue. But as I started looking around, I was like, what else is important in the Asia Pacific region that really needs our attention, but that maybe you know, someone isn't looking at, but has you know, strategic impacts for the United States? So working with Dr. Sadia Pekkanen, who is my faculty advisor up there, we narrowed down the, the topic. And as I started to look at Japan's security documents, I discovered that Japan has made some significant changes that have major impacts for the United States, for Japan, and for the Asia Pacific region. So over the last couple of years, Prime Minister Abe has sought to move Japan in a more active role towards becoming a a nation that takes the security interests um, very seriously and is more engaged in the world. He's also looked to make greater flexibility for the use of the Japanese self-defense force. Previously, any time the Japanese self-defense force was used for an operation, especially off-island, it required a special act by the Diet in order to do so. In 2013, the J government of Japan published two different documents. One, the National Defense Program Guidelines for 2014 and above, and the Medium Term Defense Program. What these is, is basically changed the fun fundamentally what the Japanese Self-Defense Force will look like in the future. They maintain the mission that they've had ever since the end of World War II, which was basically to intercept and defeat any invasion of the home islands. But two new missions were added. One was remote island defense, which meant that Japan would now defend its over 6,000 plus small islands that are part of its archipelagos. And the second part was to be able to recapture any islands that was taken by an opposing force, which before Japan had not even looked at and basically relied upon the United States to provide those security guarantees. With these two documents, Japan began, began to reshape its self-defense forces to make it into a, a force that's more viable to the U.S.-Japan alliance and in the Pacific region. The objective of my research was to answer two questions. First of all, will Japan have the capability to conduct independent amphibious operations as it states in its published defense guidelines? And then second of all, if it does have these capabilities, what will the impact be on the Asia Pacific region? In order to determine this, I had to look at three different areas. First of all, where does Japan sit right now as far as an amphibious capability? Second of all, what are its future capabilities as it's currently funded in its procurement program? And what is its doctrine or publications in its defense publications? And then thirdly, what will happen when Japan reaches these capabilities and when is it expected that they will do so? In order to do this, I followed a, a method that the Army uses in looking at its capabilities. Basically, when we're determining you know, what to do for the future or developing something that will benefit us in the future, we use an acronym called DOTLM-PF, one of these big you know, military acronyms, which basically stands for seven different areas, and you can see those there. But the military, anytime we're looking at something in the future, we look at these seven different areas and we see how they apply to the problem. That's what I've done in my research this year in applying this to the Jap Japanese Self-Defense Force. For a comparison, I use the U.S. amphibious capability which currently exists in the Asia Pacific on a permanent basis, which is a Marine Corps Expeditionary Unit and amphibious ready group from our United States Navy. And then last of all, I looked at strategic impacts for the, the East, East Asia area. Just to start with, and I won't go into much detail, this is what the United States brings to its alliance with Japan on a permanent basis in the Asia Pacific region to conduct amphibious operations. 
Basically from the Navy, you see those three large ships up there? Those provide the ability to basically take a full package of soldiers, helicopters, Marines, and take them anywhere in the Asia Pacific region within a couple of days and provide 15 days worth of sustainability. Basically they're able to conduct operations completely independently for a 15 day period. On those three ships, all the, all the vehicles and personnel that you see down below with the a, with a different aircraft, with the different um, joint light tactical vehicles or Humvees as we currently have, the amphibious vehicles, the cannons, the artillery, everything that you see there is packaged up on those ships. And those ships can basically be anywhere in the Asia Pacific in about five to six days and be able to, through these boats and through these different aircraft, put those soldiers and that equipment onto the shore. So as we compare Japan's capability that they want to develop, we use this as a baseline because this is what allows the United States military to conduct its five major operations. And we'll talk to those a little bit later. So as we look at the first area, the first area is doctrine. Right now, Japan does not have its own doctrine for conducting amphibious operations. This is a change. A lot of the amphibious doctrine that actually came out of World War II was originally developed by the Japanese. And throughout World War II, they effectively used this doctrine in capturing places such as the Philippines, in doing operations into China, and throughout the Asia Pacific region. Within US doctrine currently, there's five major missions that we expect our amphibious forces to be able to do. And I'll talk those a little bit more in detail later. But basically a withdrawal, which is pulling troops or civilians off of an island, a raid, which is occupying an island for a short period of time, a demonstration, which is basically showing your capability to cause your enemy to make a decision that he normally wouldn't do, an amphibious assault, you can imagine you know, your World War II movies with the Marines storming ashore, that's your, your biggest amphibious operation, and the last one is your crisis response, such as we saw in Japan over the last months with the earthquake that took place there with U.S. forces and Japanese forces working together to provide humanitarian aid. In the future, Japan currently has no established doctrine, as I mentioned, and currently no plans to develop it. But as Japan gets closer towards developing some of their other capabilities, we expect this doctrine to start to be developed. The big thing that will be critical is basically their joint forces, being able to work their, their naval, their ground, and their air forces together, because they're currently very, very limited on their policies and procedures. In fact, most of the time, the Japanese can work better with US forces than they can with their own internal uh, capabilities. The next area I looked at was their organization. How do they organize their forces? Currently, they have a one battalion, which is about 640 soldiers that have conducted amphibious operations and done some training with the United States. By 2018, Japan will stand up a 3,000 person rapid deployment brigade. They'll be used for amphibious operations. Within their maritime or their Navy, they currently have four flotillas, which is a large grouping of ships that's based on a helicopter destroyer. So think mini aircraft carrier that carries helicopters. They also have three amphibious landing dock ships, which are those ships that carry all the soldiers and the, the equipment. So when we look at their naval capabilities, their organization, they don't plan on making any major changes there in the next couple of years. As far as their air forces, once again, they currently have F-4 and F-2. So think your F-4 Vietnam era type aircraft, your F-2 is similar to our F-16s, which are a fairly capable aircraft. Um, in the future, they'll move two additional squadrons down to Okinawa, which, which is where they see some of their major threats against China. And they'll also acquire F-35, which is a new aircraft that's coming online with the, the US and its allies across the world. The biggest thing they'll have to take place is in their joint forces. They currently have a joint staff office and amphibious operations development office, but those have limited capabilities. They do not have a standing joint force that brings all their forces together to be able to conduct amphibious operations, and that's something they'll have to do in the near future. When you look at their training, Japan has been training its forces in amphibious operations since 2006 on a very limited basis. They will continue to conduct operations with the United States and other allies within the region to develop their training capability to be able to do this. Some of the exercises we'll see in the future are things such as Yamasakura, which involves the, the Western Army, which has that amphibious capability, and which will take ne place next year, and that First Corps here is um, very heavily involved in. Japan has also budget, budgeted funds to be able to conduct those joint operations that we've talked about. When we look at their material, this is the part where people get really excited because there's really cool you know, military things on it. But Japan, in order to develop its amphibious capability, has had to invest in some of these systems. If you look at your, your top left, which is called the AAV-7, it's basically a, a personnel carrier that can hold up to about 30 personnel and move them from a ship to a shore under armored conditions, and then has tracks to be able to operate on ground. Japan currently has none of these within their, their system. They acquired four this year in, 2004, in 2016 to basically use as a test bed to see how that these would work out. Just last month, they officially announced their purchase of these systems, which will be coming from BAE Industries, 
with 34 acquired in 2017, additional up to 45 in 2018, and then budgets have not been established for the system. But it'll give Japan an armored capability to move from those ship to shores underneath fire. Your next one in your top right is your MV-22, which is a tilt rotor aircraft that our Air Force and Marines have been using for a number of years, and in fact was just recently used in the disaster relief in, in Japan. You can see that by 2022, Japan will have acquired 17 systems, which will provide them a very robust capability. Your next three things that are listed on there are basically ships. So if you look down at your bottom, you have your DDHs, which are basically a mini aircraft carrier that holds helicopters. They currently have two, three of those in their inventory, two of one type and two of another with another one that's undergoing sea, to, sea uh, capabilities. These will provide Japan the ability to move its forces basically anywhere within the Pacific in several days. The other ship that they have is their landing ship dock, which you see there in the center. And basically that's the one that holds all their troops and all their supplies and can move them by boat from, from t ship to shore. They'll undergo a critical upgrade in the next three years, which allows them to take those AAV-7s and be able to launch them off that back deck and be able to swim those things to, to shore with their soldiers aboard. And then the last thing you see is their F-35, which is the newest fifth generation fighter. The uh, U.S. is currently producing four of those, and they're coming off the assembly line in the United States as we speak. The remaining uh, 38 of those aircraft will be produced in-house in Japan. So Japan has been very good in the past about acquiring technologies from the United States and producing its own aircraft and its own military equipment, and it'll have that same agreement with the United States to produce those remaining aircraft over the next couple of years. Leadership and education. Japan has a very robust leadership and education program and an exchange program with the United States Navy and the Marine Corps. The one thing they currently lack is they do not train on any amphibious doctrine within their, their schoolhouses. In the future, we expect that to possibly change, but the key will be that link between the United States forces and their officers attending our schools and attending training here in the United States. As we look at their personnel, as I mentioned, they have a small battalion, 640 soldiers. They're currently training on amphibious operations. One of their problems is they have um, a very a cohort system where a group of soldiers comes in and they basically progress through the, the ranks and they actually have a very high retention rate with their soldiers in Japan. So what this has allowed is a lot of sergeants are basically a lot of chiefs and few you know, Indians within their ground forces. So Japan is looking at changing this within the next couple of years. Their naval forces are limited because of their small size and so if they acquire any more ships in the future, one of the things that Japan will have to either look at doing is basically moving capabilities from one type of ship to another or increasing their naval forces. And their air forces are currently sufficient. As we look into the future, as I mentioned, 3,000 soldiers will be trained in amphibious operations in the near future with minimal changes to their ground and naval forces. Facilities, basically for their ground forces, when you move a force from about 640 soldiers up to 3,000, you've got to have a place for them to live, to, to work, and those type of things. So that has been budgeted in the Japanese um, budget for the next couple of years and you can see a picture of the facility is actually being built on one of their southwestern islands called Camp Yanaguni and they recently established a radar facility there which can basically put radar coverage all the way out to Taiwan and the western part of, of China which provides them a huge capability. So as we look at over all these things, you know, individually it's kind of hard to imagine how does this you know, all equate together. So what we take a look at is in 2016. There's a couple areas where Japan has some very big gaps in their joint organization, in their joint training, and some limited capabilities across most of their forces. As we look out to 2020, we'll start to see those forces become fully capable in their developing things such as their organization, their training coming online, um, their materials such as their, you know, their new systems being fielded, and their personnel and facilities also coming online. But as we look at 2022, we still see a few gaps in their, their joint doctrine and basically in their joint operations. What does that mean for Japan as far as its missions go? As I mentioned, there's five different missions. Right now, Japan can conduct support to crisis response operations. We've seen Japan do that you know, most recently with the earthquake there, also in the Philippines and Indonesia, deploying ships and soldiers and, and personnel to be able to help out in these, these operations. And amphibious withdrawal. Can Japan move soldiers and civilians off of an island in the case of an emergency or a, an attack? Yes, they can, but their capability is very limited right now. They're also able to do a limited raid. You saw on the very first slide those soldiers with the rubber rafts, you know, sitting there with their paddles. Yes, they can paddle in from a ship just about anywhere to, to an island to conduct a, a raid or seize an objective for a limited amount of time. But once again, it's only a very small force that can do that. In the future, we expect that to be a very robust capability up to a company, usually about you know, 120 soldiers up to a battalion size. 
The two that even by 2020, Japan will have some very difficult um, difficulty conducting are demonstration and assault. An assault is, once again, that met, mentioned that World War II type objective where you have an enemy that's holding an island, and you have to you know, attack that island in the face of a, a very steady opposition that's sitting there and trying to keep you from taking that island. So even by 2022, Japan will be very limited and probably not have the capability independently to conduct an amphibious assault operation. Once again, they'll go back to the United States and our capabilities with our Marine Corps to be able to do that jointly with the, the Japanese. A demonstration is simply pretending that we're going to conduct an amphibious assault so that the enemy makes a decision that you want them to, to move their forces. A good example is in 91, when the United States uh, attacked from, to retake Kuwait, our Marine Corps did a demonstration off the coast, which caused Saddam to shift his forces, look more at the coast, and had us to allow our forces to go in through, through the land. So in those two areas, Japan is going to be limited even by the 2022 timeframe when all their other capabilities will come online. Now, what does this mean for the, the regional area? We'll look at three different hotspots. We'll also look at the region as a whole and its impacts on the United States. So the first one, Russia. Ever since World War II, Japan has never signed a peace treaty with Russia. And Russia was able to seize four islands that belonged to Japan before World War II, which are the Northern Territories or the Kuril Islands. Um, Japan will not have the capabilities, even with its new amphibious capabilities, to retake these islands. Bottom line is Russia still has a very sizable force. It's located in the Northeast uh, Pacific area. And even with these forces that Japan develops, they will not be able to confront Russia directly. Probably more importantly is Japan does not have the political will or does not want to look at you know, conducting an offensive operation. First of all, it violates their constitution. Second of all, Japan has had a 70 plus year of pacifism ever since the end of World War II. And also it violates international law. Bottom line is we expect the status quo between Russia and Japan in the future, and hopefully maybe some thawing of, of ties both militarily and also on the economic side. Prime Minister Abe two weeks ago met with um, President Putin and discussed some of those, those future things with Japan and cooperation with Russia and possibly a peace treaty. So we'll see how that pans out in the future, but we expect a, probably a status quo situation with Russia. The Korean Peninsula. These four little islands sit basically right in the middle between Japan and, and South Korea. Takashima is what the Japanese call them, Dokto is what the, the South Koreans call them. They're currently occupied by uh, the Republic of Korea Coast Guard and a police unit. And when I look at the pictures there, that's one place I would never want to be you know, stationed out there on a rock in the middle of the, you know, the Sea of J Japan. Uh, once again, as we look at this, Japan will have the capability to do a small operation to take these islands. But the thing comes back, once again, to political situations. Will Japan want to do this? You know, absolutely not. One thing that is thought over the last couple of years is the relationship between South Korea and between Japan. In fact, on the 28th of June, uh, United States, South Korea, and Japan will actually conduct their first joint military exercise off of Hawaii, where they'll use their Aegis-class uh, destroyers basically to track, you know, possible you know, North Korean targets from, from missiles from North Korea. So with increased intelligence sharing, with increased economic cooperation between the, the two, for Japan is more, is more advantageous to continue with the status quo and to develop friendly relations with South Korea and possibly you know, develop even greater military capability sharing between the two countries. So where is our biggest threat for, for Japan in the area? Once again, it's China. It's particularly over some islands called Senkakus by the Japan or the Daioyu Islands by China. Japan has owned and administered these islands since the late 1880s, and, current, and the Japanese government currently owns them. They actually purchased them from a, giant, uh, from a private Japanese landowner about six years ago. Japan is increasingly able to defend these islands and to reinforce them. As I mentioned, they placed a, a radar station on Yonaguni, which is um, a different island chain, but fairly close to these areas. They're moving two fighter squadrons to Okinawa a rapid deployment battalion in the future, and this amphibious capability that Japan is building will allow them to reinforce the Senkakus or any of their islands in their southwest chain a lot easier than they are now, often moving them within you know, a couple hours or a couple days for large ships. The key thing that Japan will not have, as I mentioned before, is the capability to retake these islands if China takes them. But once again, that would be a, a, major, cha a major challenge by China involving their conventional forces, their naval and their air forces, and basically a pretty much all-out war between China, China and Japan if they were to do this overtly. The thing that Japan will have the capability to do is, like we've seen in the past, China has allowed fishing boats to drop off students out on these islands basically to, to protest you know, small groups of, of civilians that to these islands. Japan will be able to easily remove these people or even keep them from um, obtaining these islands. 
The key thing will be that continued reliance upon the United States through the U.S.-Japan alliance to be able to continue to deter China and to retake islands if necessary. What does this mean for Southeast Asia? The biggest thing is it's, it expands Japan's soft power. And we've seen this through humanitarian assistance and also through military exercises that Japan has conducted with the Philippines, with Vietnam, and also with Australia. A lot of these countries see China as a greater threat than, than Japan, which was not the case even as, much as, even as little as 10 years ago. But with China's increasing aggressiveness in the South China Sea, many of these countries are looking at a stronger relationship with Japan. Japan also continues to have strong economic ties with many of these countries in the region and possibly a future for Japanese military exports as we've seen Japan recently sell or loan to the Philippines military coast guard ships and also reconnaissance planes for the future. What we can expect is increased cooperation between Japan and many of the countries in Southeast Asia that hedge against China. What does this mean for the United States? Increased amphibious capability makes Japan a greater partner with the United States and allows us to, to share the burden of defense in the Asia Pacific region. Once again, Japan will still be relying upon the U.S. for that amphibious capability to retake remote islands if necessary. Bases in Okinawa will continue to be a touchy sub subject both between the United States and Japan and particularly the population there. As many of Okinawa's, many of our forces are actually stationed in Okinawa and they feel that they have an un unfair you know, burden that they're being placed upon the people there. What is our projection for the future? Closer ties with Japan in the Asia Pacific region, continuing reinforcement of our common goals of, uh, in the Asia Pacific region and also possible greater cooperation between us and other allies within the region. So as, as we look at the overall assessment for Japan, Japan's amphibious capability is really a change for them for over the last 70 years. The first time that we can actually see an offensive capability that's been developed within the Japanese forces. While if you look at those pictures strategically, the ability to retake an island is a, a strategic defensive operation. But as we look at it from many of their neighbors, such as China, seeing that capability for Japan to be able to project its forces out there in, onto remote islands is an offensive capability and something that China really worries about. But the bottom line is we expect the United States and Japan to continue with increased security cooperation in the future and um, security cooperation throughout its allies in the Asia Pacific. Conclusions. I mentioned these uh, already, but we expect Japan to be able to continue with their, their operations. But the, as we look at the dates, 2022 is that key date when we see Japan developing those capabilities and bringing all those pieces together. Japan will continue to increase its soft power throughout the region. And once again, the sticking point that we need to really keep an eye on is the East China Sea between Japan and China over the Senkaku Islands. But once again, with Japan's renewed capabilities here, we expect greater deterrence from Japan and a strong backing from the United States in the U.S.-Japan alliance. That concludes my remarks for today, and I open it up for any questions or, or discussion that you might have. <laughs> that one. Um, it, it appears to be a significant shift in quantity. Is that in response to China? What What is the catalyst for that increased armament? About the same time frame, Japan conducted a, a new threat assessment that they, they used. For the last 70 years, basically Japan has seen Russia as being their, their number threat throughout the, the Cold War. The scenario was always the, you know, in the Cold War scenario that Russia would attack, attack down through Hokkaido, Hokkaido and the Northern Islands. And so Japan's forces were really emphasized on, on tanks, artillery, you know, a Cold War, War style confrontation. As they started looking at the threat now, well, there's not an expectation that Russia would ever conduct those type of operations now. The threat comes down to those 6,000 plus remote islands Japan has in its, in its archipelago. So what you don't see on here is they still have lots of tanks, lots of artillery, lots of big guns that would you know, fight a conventional force. But what they need is things that they can move rapidly from their main islands or from other islands to these smaller islands and also the ships to be able to move those things there. So the change has come within the new threat percep perception which they see China as their, as their main threat and be able to counter China, particularly in those southwest islands. I guess for recording purposes, they're recording this thing, so please use the, the mic for your questions. Um, 
It, thank you, Jaron. It was really interesting. And something I didn't know is that the US built its own amphibious doctrine off of Japan's. And and also that Japan doesn't have one right now. So especially given the question about what is the current threat assessment, do you expect that doctrine as it's developed now to differ much? Japan is really good about, just as we've seen with technology, of modifying things. So you know, talking with a number of officers in Japan, what they'll probably do is that they'll take the US doctrine, which they've been operating with our forces with, and then just modify that to fit their, you know, their current doctrine or what they project to do in the, in the future. But you know, as, as we look at it, basically between the time of World War One and World War Two, you know, there was you know two countries that really developed their amphibious capabilities and their amphibious doctrine. One was Japan, and the other one was the United States, with a little bit, you know, also with with Great Britain. And we see that you know in the Normandy invasion and and whatnot. But these ships that you see up here, they have one in the back of them. They have what's called a well deck, which basically allows them to lower a ramp and fill that up with with water to take smaller boats and be able to move troops and equipment from ship to shore. That was a design developed by the Japanese in the 1930s. That when the United States saw those ships, they're like, wow, this is a great idea. And so our, our large amphibious assault ships that we have in our, our Navy right now are based off those designs. And so, you know, Japan has been building its, its own ships. It's basically just going back to, you know, what they did, you know, in World War II and then taking what the United States has learned from there and modifying those things to make them even more capable than they were before. In your leader development and leader, I'll use the term culture uh, analysis, uh, did you look at all at, uh, you mentioned that there's no joint doctrine now, did you look at all uh, at the willingness uh, of the services? Typically, they've been pretty insular uh, to their willingness to work together. And, and if so, what do you think it'll take to, to move them to developing their own joint doctrine that will be supported? I think you see that changing now. They, they've realized that they have to, to work together jointly. As you mentioned before, the services were basically everyone had their mission. You know, if anyone ever gets onto the islands, the army kicks them off. You know, in order to prevent them to get there, the Navy sinks anything in the ocean, the Air Force, you know, their, you know, their Air Force is shooting anything down that comes, comes by the island. So they had their own missions They really didn't have to work together. But as they look at the, the new threat, they see that there's going to be, you know, there's going to have to be a change. So a lot of that comes in between the cooperation that the United States does with the self-defense forces, things such as First Corps, you know, doing these large operations like Yamasakura and bringing the different parts of the Japanese self-defense force to, together to confront a problem and be able to look at those type of things. So I think we see it changing gradually, especially as you see some of the, you know, the older, more senior officers retiring and the next new generation coming in that sees that, hey, your joint is what we've got to do in order to be able to defend Japan and confront this new threat in the future. Yeah, my question basically, I've uh, stationed on Tor uh, Oki uh, Tori Station on Okinawa for about four years since so <coughs> I've conducted uh, several joint operations. And my question to you is, at the time I was there before, they were trying to have us either reduce our lease or move out of the area. Um, and has that changed now? Because I know that was uh, one of the topics when I was stationed there. Yeah, so in Okinawa, that is still a very contentious issue, particularly with the uh, Fatema airfield and its you know, removal to different locations and stuff like that. And that's a constant battle between particularly you know, the government and the people of Japan and the, you know, the central government in Japan. Prime Minister Abe is very you know, supportive of keeping the US forces there and you know, building those capabilities for both US and Japan forces to be able to use. But you know, there's still a very you know, negative feeling by a lot of the people in the, you know, the government in Okinawa. They have an unfair share of the burden you know, of, of taking you know, US and Japanese forces you know, right there on that little island where everybody else you know, just has some isolated bases and stuff up there. So I think that's going to continue to be you know, contentious in the, in the future. But you know, Prime Minister Abe really supports it, so we'll, we'll see what happens after Prime Minister Abe. One last question for me. Do uh, you know if there's been an increase in the soft forces working with their soft forces at all? I don't know if there's an increase. I know that our, you know, we have soft forces stationed in Okinawa and Japan and throughout the Pacific, and we continue to do, you know, conduct operations and, and, well, more training with them. So I don't know, I can't make a comparison of, you know, it's, it's improved or it's increased, but I know that we continue to do that. Special operations forces. So your, your Green Briers, your Navy SEALs. Yeah, if, if I throw out an acronym, y'all, please raise your hand and say, I don't understand what you're saying. I have a question. Um, just looking at the increased activity in the area, and particularly aggressive acts by China, 
um, the Japanese trajectory seems still pretty far out. Um, you know, on one side that they'll not be able to retake a captured island until 2022. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, Japanese society um, and the process, the budget and planning process, and how these things kind of interplay? Is it, um, is it a slow go process for budgetary purposes or is there a political process in place here where the Japanese military doesn't want to move too quickly beyond kind of public support? I don't think it's so much the military. You know, the military is, is willing to make a lot, of these, a lot of these changes internally because of what they see as a threat. You know, the, the change has to come, you know, from the, from the civilian leadership. And the thing that's different from, you know, the U.S. system is, you know, you have a, a prime minister over there with a party that controls both houses in, you know, in their diet, in their, their parliament over there. And so, you know, the prime minister can basically, you know, basically say, hey, here's our, our policy, you know, from, our, from what we want to do as a party. That's how he's been able to push through some of these changes with the reinterpretation of the Constitution, you know, these new, new laws that have come through. So if a party controls, you know, both of their houses and the prime minister over there, they're able to push things through, you know, pretty quickly, which he did with these defense reforms. Now, when it comes to the budget process, before, I mean, Japan has still kept its, um, its budget underneath 2% uh, of its, its GDP, which is done for, for years. And there's not a lot of appetite over there to increase that, that budget. And so as you look at these particular systems, such as your MV-22, your tilt rotor aircraft there, Basically, what the self-defense forces, the ground forces were told, is if you want this capability, you've got to tell us what you're going to give up. And so they gave up a lot of force structure as far as armor artillery units to be able to purchase these helicopters, which gives them the capability to move their, you know, their tro troops from mainland to you know, the South China Sea. Now, what Japan has actually done, which is, is a pretty smart move, is in their budget process, they've been able to put, put their military budget, particularly on procurement, over a four-year time period. And so they basically do, you know, a large purchase and put it into to one year's budget, or they put they basically say, here's the four years. We're going to put it into four years budget and then plan it out over time so that they know that they're getting, you know, systems, you know, over the next four years. And so that's where you can kind of see with the with their MV-22s and that kind of a four-year period where okay, we're purchasing this many this year, this year, and this year, and those are already budgeted and basically paid for, even though that it'll come out of their their budget in the future years. Those funds are already already allocated. So unlike the U.S. military, which basically works on a you know a yearly cycle, you know allocated by by Congress, and we don't know what's going to change over the next couple of years, Japan has been pretty smart in be able to keep those capabilities at least through a four-year time period. And then if the administration changes, we'll see what happens with the budget. But basically, the systems that you see right there are you know budgeted in that up through at least 2018, 2019. I don't know if that answers your. your uh, have you seen a shift over the last even, you know, six to nine to 12 months in more support for a more aggressive Japanese military posture given China's advances? I think there's still a disconnect between a lot of the Japanese people. We saw as Prime Minister Abe pushed through his security reforms, a lot of protests, you know, which we haven't seen for a number of years related to defense. And so there's a lot of Japanese people that are still very pacifist. But you see within the leadership, you know, particularly in Prime Minister Abe's party, with a very strong, you know, aggression towards making Japan a more normal nation, if you will, that has a military capability they can use offensive and defensively. You know, talking with a number of different scholars from Japan, you know, if Prime Minister Abe had his will, I mean, he would revise their constitution, you know, probably throw out Article 9 and allow Japan to, you know, have a regular military you know, type force over there. He has not been able to do that. He's been able to push some security reforms through, but there's still not that support from the, the population. He still has to worry about elections. You know, the big thing that's really hampering him right now is the economy. You know, I think, you know, if Prime Minister Abe was able to get the economy spurred and going again, he'd get a lot more popular support, probably be able to call an election again, give him another two or three years, you know, as the, as the Prime Minister, and then be able to push through those defense reforms. But there's still a gap between the elites and between the, you know, the the regular civilian population as far as defense and, and that goes. Um, so Jaren, in one of your early slides, you uh, acronym that is a military okay. way of approaching the problem, DOT something. Oh, dot one PF. 
Uh, yes. It was a long <laughs> one. Um, and I'm actually curious, um, because you said you wanted to apply that to this question. Mm -hmm. So I'm also curious what you learned from the academic classes, conversations, other faculty, um, that has impacted the way you've approached this. Well, when you look at the capabilities, I, I took a, a very military approach. Because I've used this in the, the past when I, was, when I was working on different projects in, in TRADOC, which is Army's Training and Doctrine Command. A couple of the projects I worked on was what was called the Battlefield Surveillance Brigade, which was basically a reconnaissance brigade that the Army was developing as part of its modular force. We also looked at you know, capabilities for unmanned aerial systems for you know, projecting 10, 20 years out into the, the military. So I've got some experience using this, this process. So when I was looking at you know, Japan's capabilities and comparing it to what we have, that's where you know, this analysis process came from. What I really learned from the Jackson School and from the University of Washington here was understanding the regional picture. You know, what things are important to Japan? How do their internal policies impact their you know, defense spending? You know, how does their, their government interactions with South Korea, with Russia, with the other countries in the region, how do they work together? You know, talking with you know, China experts, Japan experts, you know, security specialists up there at the Jackson School you know, helped me to understand a lot more where I'd looked at the tactical level. You know, how does a soldier get from point A to point, point B and conduct his mission? To looking at that strategic level where, okay, how does changing one law you know, impact how other countries in the region look at Japan? And by you know, bringing these capabilities, how are other countries now going to look at you know, Japan with these capabilities? As I mentioned before, it's, you know, this is an offensive capability or can be used offensively. So especially countries like China, you know, they still beat the, the drum you know, very highly of you know, during World War II, here's what Japan did to the whole Asia Pacific region. You know, the greater co-prosperity sphere, occupying islands, you know, the atrocities that took place there. And in you know, many people's minds, Japan has never apologized you know, for these atrocities that, that took place. So understanding those you know, very intricate relationships between the, the countries, and even places like South Korea and Japan, which have a very common enemy in, in North Korea with the nuclear, you know, possible nuclear threat with ballistic missiles and that, you know, up until this point, basically if South Korea had some information they wanted to give to Japan, they'd basically tell the United States and say, yes, you can release it, and then Japan would tell, or, you know, vice versa, South Korea to J US to Japan and, and back and forth. But with, you know, hopefully that's changing with some of these intelligence sharing agreements and with the training that we're going, they're going to be doing in the future, where at least on ballistic missile defense against North Korea, there would be a shared system between those three countries where, you know, whoever was the best country to respond to that situation could respond. Whether it's a Japanese ship, you know, based off of a, you know, South Korean or a U.S. radar system or something like that. So those would be the, you know, things we'd hope to see in the, the future. But what I really gained from here is that intricacy of the whole international system, how it works and how these countries in the region interact. Uh, real quick, what? So, so, sort of counterfactually, what is the cost of them not doing this? So, if tomorrow, you know, Shinzo Abe is recalled and it all goes away, what's the cost of them not doing this? I think the the biggest cost would be in Japan's deterrence when facing China, because because right now Japan has very limited capability in those south southwest islands, and Japan or in, and China has used a lot of you know fishing boats, coast guard vessels, and those different things to basically you know, push against Japan. Where is Japan weak? Where is Japan going to take a stand and where is it, you know, going to let us through? So developing this capability, one of the things it really does for Japan is it says, hey, we're willing to defend these islands. You know, we're developing the capability to do that and we even want to have the capability to retake them. So what it does is, I don't think it really affects, you know, the relationships between South Korea, you know, and Russia, but what it does is it, it makes Japan look weaker and probably allows China to be a little bit more aggressive in its position towards Japan in the southwestern islands. For comments, I'm willing to <laughs> discuss things with you too. Jared, <laughs> for talking to us. Um, what this shows uh, is the increased um, commitment that the United States is putting in to this new, all this new uh, building up of Japan's forces. I mean, I, that's kind of what I see is we are also uh, making a huge commitment to them, along with them building up their forces. And I don't know what the implications that has for us 
for the United States, but it looks pretty huge. And I mean, you're right. The United States has always had a had a very you know large commitment to Japan, and still will continue to do so in the future. I think one of the things that's changing that I really had an opportunity to, to research and talk about was the Yoshida Doctrine, which was one of their early prime ministers after World War II, where Japan played it very smartly, basically saying, we are going to focus on economic development because the United States guaranteed them with their nuclear umbrella and with the U.S.-Japan alliance to, project, to, to protect Japan. And so basically Japan was, you know, very, built very minimal forces over there because they put all their emphasis on their, on their economy. And that has benefited Japan for many years as far as being able to do that. But what you see Japan doing now is basically developing those capabilities where they can be a better partner with the United States. Yes, it's still a huge you know, investment that we're making into Japan, to South Korea, and to many of the countries in the Asia Pacific. But we're looking for more equal you know, partners between those nations that can, can do so. All right, if there's no further comments or questions, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to present this you know, research today. And, once again, having the, the great support that I've received from you know, University of Washington, the Jackson School, the Tacoma campus here in between JBLM, and back to Lisa. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Uh, um, and General Monson, are you Well, I just want to congratulate Jaron, and, and I just want to go back to three points, and these really tie back to some of the questions. You know, one of the points here was about, you talked about dot mil PF. I think one of the advantages of these senior service fellowships, it teaches us how to think differently. And I think what you've offered us here and what University of Washington Tacoma offers us in the Jackson School is we have a pretty clear way of thinking after 20 something years in the military. And these kinds of programs where Jaron had to interface with different people, different thoughts, teaches us to think differently, number one, which is important for us as military leaders. Number two, it makes us better leaders. So Jaron, having left the fellowship program here at University of Washington Tacoma and the Jackson School, will be a better leader going into a strategic assignment in the Pacific, which is exactly what we wanted out of this program. We wanted you to go to a strategic assignment, and you will. And I think the third thing is then hopefully we've taught other people perhaps how to think differently. So within the course, you know, as Jaron interfaced with the students, interfaced with the faculty, then maybe there's a different perspective on this. So now as you look at Japan, as you look at the Constitution and Article 9 for self-defense, and as Prime Minister Abe reassesses that Constitution, perhaps we've given you a different perspective on Japan in the future, reference not only their defense and security issues, but the economic impact it has on the region. I hope Jaron has provided some of that. So again, I just want to thank University of Washington Tacoma. I want to thank the Jackson School. And, and I do want to thank, again, Dr. Pagano, of course, Dr. Lavitt, uh, Rasab, Dr. Rasab, but thank you very much. Jennifer Butal and the Mays program, of course, Lisa Hoffman and Roz, thank you very much. I'm not going to leave anybody out here. So of course, your uh, instructor, Sadia Pekonk, and, and of course, Sarah Castro, that allowed these trips to occur. This relationship is huge. And again, I just want to echo what was said earlier. This doesn't happen in one year without the collective support of the entire team here. And whether you're wearing a suit or a dress or a uniform here, it has been a team effort to do this. And I think the biggest benefactor has been Jaron. So I want to congratulate you for your effort, your hard work. Next year, we'll have another fellow here, Colonel Owen, and the year after that, two fellows. And this program will continue to grow. And thank you for being such a trailblazer in this program. And thank University of Washington Tacoma and, of course, the Jackson School for making this happen. We appreciate your work and the teamwork and the cooperation. And again, to you, Jared, congratulations.